Hello and welcome to EPG Path Shala. This is Stuti Goswami. The module that we are going to do now is module number 18 and the title of the module is Participation of Women in Decision Making and Peace Processes. Now the impact of war or any situation of conflict on women can be manifold and it can range from sexual exploitation including sexual slavery and prostitution to malnutrition, pregnancy related complications, different diseases, particularly sexually transmitted diseases and AIDS, mental health issues and post-traumatic stress disorders among others. Along with it, economic security becomes a very, very important factor in endangering the dignity of women in a situation of conflict, particularly in a situation of armed conflict. In this, the problems of elderly women too cannot be discounted. Therefore, the presence and participation of women in peace process is essential because it can have a tremendous role in the reconstruction process in the aftermath of a war or a situation of conflict, as well as in healing the physical, emotional, psychological scars of war-related violence. Women bring in their personal experiences to empathize with the plight of their fellow women who are estranged in conflict. Also, often in peace negotiations, women's concerns are sadly ignored. Therefore, as decision makers, women are an essential requirement in the establishment of peace and security in the world. Both the United Nations and the civil society at large have long focused on the necessity of representation of women in peace negotiations and in peacekeeping operations. And there is also an increasing acknowledgement that the mere presence of women in the peace table is not enough. Rather, the women should be allowed and should be enabled to voice their concerns and opinions in the strongest possible manner. Also, gender issues in all aspects of peace processes have to be taken into consideration. The participation of women and inclusion of gender perspectives in peace agreements also help to guarantee the special needs and priorities of women in post-conflict situations. For example, we may cite this incident or rather this development that took place during the partition of British India into India and Pakistan. During that time, about 50,000 Muslim women in India and about 33,000 non-Muslim women in Pakistan were either abducted or abandoned by their families or separated from their families. As Paula Banerjee says, in refugee repatriation, a politics of gender, the two states of India and Pakistan embarked upon a massive central recovery project and as a consequence of this effort, about 30,000 women were recovered by their respective states. And uh, there were of course uh, various complications that arose in the aftermath of that recovery. What happened was that an abducted person's bill was brought in in the Indian Parliament. This bill gave unlimited power to police officers regarding abducted persons. But as Ritu Menon and Kamla Bhasin say, in abducted women, the state and question of honor, what happened was many such recovered women had already been forced to either convert to another religion or were forced to marry a man of another religion. So when they were finally discovered or rather recovered, they had to give up their children because those children had been born of Muslim fathers in Pakistan. This was the case in India. On the other hand, the former biological families of these recovered women either refused or were unwilling to accept them back for they believed that those women had been either defiled or polluted. And so at the end of this whole 
thing, what happened was the identities of these quote unquote recovered women were unstable. Thus we see how women were not seen so much as human beings or as individuals but as mere facts or figures. Now when we look at the participation of women in certain peace movements, firstly let us look at the participation of women in peace movements in Europe during the First World War. The First World War, as we all know, witnessed unprecedented devastation, but the presence and activities of women peacemakers of that period in Europe were significant. And yet, their presence and participation were considerably limited as well. Further, opinions were also divided at the time as to whether these women peacemakers should support the war or oppose it and questions of patriotism and nationalism to emerged and many of these peacemakers were critiqued or at, were under attack from their British government and broader sections of society for not being patriotic enough. This eventually led to a split in these organizations along international and nationalistic lines. Another uh, organization in the United States of America at the time was the Women Peace Party formed in 1915 by Jane Addams and Carrie Chapman Catt among others. This organization was also opposed to the First World War. Sylvia Pankhurst, one of the few suffragettes who opposed the war, proposed a women's peace expeditionary force that would comprise about a thousand or at least a thousand women who would go to the battlefront and stay between the opposing armies. The International Committee of Women for Permanent Peace was formed out of the International Women's Congress against World War I held at Budapest in 1915. In 1921, the International Committee for Women for Permanent Peace was named the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom or WILPF. The Women's Peace Party of the United States of America became the U.S. branch of the WILPF. And yet, it is significant that the sentiments of the female peace activists were barely, if ever, recorded, officially. Rather, such information that we have could be gathered much later from the memoirs and journal entries of those women as well as from the records of the peace organizations and in the articles and letters to the editor that these peace activists had sent and had published in the newspapers. Women's peace movements in the second half of the 20th century became more visible and women were less constrained by ideas of patriotism unlike their predecessors. Some of the significant peace movements of this period include the Women's Strike for Peace formed in 1961 by Bella Abzug and Dagmar Wilson in the United States of America. This movement had the objective of securing a ban on nuclear testing in order to save the future of the younger generations. This organization was one of the first such organizations in the United States of America to oppose the Vietnam War. In 1961, this organization had about 50,000 women coming together across 60 cities in the United States of America to protest against nuclear weapons, making it one of the largest national women's peace protests in the 20th century. Across the Atlantic, in England, the Greenham Common Women's Peace Camp was established in 1981 to protest against nuclear weapons being based at the RAF Greenham Common in Berkshire. This movement began when the organization called Women for Life on Earth arrived at the RAF Greenham Common to oppose the British government's decision of allowing missiles to be based there. The protesters were all women because the emphasis was on the identity of motherhood that was terrified at the violent and dangerous prospects that this foresaw would follow as a consequence of nuclear activities. In Israel, women's peace movements began to emerge from the 1980s and these movements gained momentum with the passage of time. 
The first significant peace movement in Israel began in 1978 when Peace Now, a non-governmental organization, was formed. Now, although women were actively involved in this organization from the outset, they began to realize that they were being marginalized within the organization. Women's roles being majorly in that organization confined to organizational activities while being denied of leadership roles. It was during Israel's war with Lebanon in 1982-85 uh, that a women's peace movement began to emerge where women began to seize control of decision making. A movement that began in 1983 was Parents Against Silence which later on came to be identified as Mothers Against Silence. This movement politicized motherhood, thereby mobilizing women to openly express their thoughts on issues of national security, which was again something like a rarity at the time because women were generally never seen to be knowledgeable about national issues. In the year 2000, a network called the Coalition of Women for Peace was formed. Now this was an umbrella organization of several women's groups and it was founded with the objective of both increasing inclusion of women in public discourses and ensuring involvement of women in peace negotiations. Some of the important organizations that were a part of this network were NELED Women for Coexistence founded in 1989, The Fifth Mother, Women in Black that began in 1988 and Bachelom that began in 2001 among others. Another significant organization of Israel is the International Women's Peace Service founded in the year 2002 and this is the only all-women peace organization working in the occupied West Bank area. In Liberia, there has been virtually uninterrupted unrest since the first civil war broke out in 1989. In such a situation, the peace movement, Women of Liberia Mass Action for Peace contributed greatly towards bringing an end to the civil war in the year 2003. This movement was initiated by social activist Lema Gubovi and Comfort Freeman, who were presidents of two Lutheran churches. And these two women formed a Women in Peace Building Network. Soon, these uh, efforts were joined by Asatu Ba Kineth, who was the president of the Liberia Female Law Enforcement Association, who formed the Liberian Muslim Women's Organization. She brought in the Muslim women to join forces with the Christian women in order to raise demand for peace. In fact, this organization held joint prayer meetings and the first such meeting was held on April 1. Apart from this, the Liberian women also went on a sex strike, which was very significant because through that sex strike, these women denied sex to their partners till the war ended. Members also of this organization also staged demonstrations and protest marches and very significantly played a pivotal role in bringing the warring sides to the, to the discussion table and ensured negotiations for peace. On the 15th of December 1975, the United Nations General Assembly in its resolution 3520 declared 1976 to 1985 as the United Nations Decade for Women, Equality, Development and Peace. This step increased awareness about the importance of women in all aspects of life and building of society. It is also believed that this step also led to the increased participation of women in peace movements in the United States of America and across the world. However, it is also pertinent question that women are probably still not as involved as they need to be in peace processes when we look at the situations of conflict all over the world. In fact, it can even be called a sad, sad truth. The examples that we have already mentioned in this module uh, show that women can and do play a proactive role whenever the requirement of peace negotiation arises. 
However, often the media also plays a negative role. One example could be uh, that of the efforts and agitations of the women in the Greenham camp. At the height of those agitations, media largely tended to ignore the action of the women by highlighting instead the fact that these women were disrupting activities of the camp and they were at the same time ignoring their responsibilities at home. A stance that could be easily termed sexist and prejudiced. But unfortunately, that was the discourse generated by the media. And so, uh, whenever we talk about peace negotiations and the role of women in peace negotiations and peace processes, it is also important to remember that the media also has a very important role to play. In 2010, the UN Women published a document titled Women's Participation in Peace Negotiations, Connections Between Presence and Influence. This report covered 31 peace processes between the years 1992 and 2011 and this report highlighted the dismal rate of women's participation in decision-making aspects of peace processes. And yet, we do have a few instances where women did play a very important role in peace processes. Let us look at a few of those instances. Uh, before we go on to that, I think we also have to remember that women can play an important role in peacemaking processes only when there are grassroots initiatives, often involving and led by women. And these initiatives should be valued and recognized and appreciated and also politically supported. These initiatives play an integral role in building and sustaining peace and more should be done to focus not only on formal processes and governance but also on the informal like as I have already mentioned grassroots initiatives. A very good example of this could be drawn from the state of Manipur in India. The women's peace movement in Manipur has played a very significant role over the last several decades. Known as the Mera Paibi movement, it is opposed to the presence of the Indian Army in the state and the Draconian Armed Forces Special Powers Act or AFSPA as well as drug abuse and crimes against women. The literally Mera Paibi refers to a woman torchbearer. Now this movement derives its name from the idea and the image of the torchbearer where women actually march through the city streets and the streets of the towns and villages with flaming torches in hand often at night. Now this is symbolic of firstly their opposition to or their protest against the human rights violation taking place in Manipur for decades and at the same time uh, such marches also play the role of patrolling duties. Uh, it is in fact, even said that this movement in Manipur is probably the biggest such grassroots civilian movement in India. Of course, this is not new to Manipur because there have been such initiatives even during the British era. Uh, here we can just particularly uh, refer to the women's wars of 1908 and 1938 where Manipuri women really stood up in arms against the atrocities of the British. The withdrawal of this AFSPA uh, has been at the very heart of this Mirai Paibi movement, which is a non-violent movement, we have to remember. Uh, in fact, before we move on, I think it is important for me to mention this particular incident that took place in the year 2004, when 12 Manipuri middle-aged women stood naked in front of the Kangla fort where the Assam rifles were stationed. Now, these women carried one banner that said, Indian Army rape us. Now, this incident uh, stemmed from the violation and the uh, uh, killing of a lady called T. Manorama uh, by the members of the or by the personnel of the Assam Rifles. Another instance would be that of Irom Sharmila, uh, uh, who had been on a hunger strike for 16 long years to demand the removal of the Asfa from Manipur. So, we see that this is, I think, this is a very good example of how a grassroots initiative can play an important role in not simply highlighting a problem that is uh, that a society is ridden with but also in finding some kind of solutions 
Now let us look at two or three examples where some differences have been women at peace negotiations by the participation of women in the peace processes. We have to understand that the entire character of the discourse changes or rather the entire discourse changes when women are included in peace negotiations. The experience of women differ significantly from men when it comes to conflict situations. And also the experience of ordinary women differs greatly from that of politicians who are often the people involved in policy making and decision making. So the participation of women in peace processes can play a very, very important role as we will find from the examples. First example could be that of the International Congress of Women or ICW that was formed in 1915 by women from more than 12 countries. Now, these women and this uh, forum demanded the creation of a non-partisan international organization to mediate disputes between countries. The ICW sent 30 of their delegates on the first women's peace mission to bring the plan of action to the heads of European states. Many of the 14 points that President Woodrow Wilson took to the Vesalis talks that finally ended the war was provided by the president of the ICW, Jane Adams. The second example could be that from Northern Ireland. Now, in the Northern Ireland also, women played a crucial role in peace negotiations. According to former U.S. Senator George Mitchell, and I quote, the emergence of women as a political force was a significant factor in achieving the agreement. Women were among the first to express their wariness of the conflict. Through their own perseverance and talent, by the end of the process, they, that is the women, were termed as valued contributors, unquote. Now, this is from George Mitchell's lecture on preventive diplomacy and conflict resolution in the United Nations, integrating theory and practice at the School of International and Public Affairs, Columbia University. And this lecture was delivered on the 8th of April, 2002. If we look at India, one could look at the important role women have played in conflict resolution in the state of Nagaland. Though electoral politics does not seem to have really empowered women in a major way in Nagaland, uh, there are areas in the public sphere where women have made, have carved niche for themselves in negotiations. The best known of these organizations is the Naga Mothers Association or the NMA. Now, this uh, organization came into existence on the 14th of February 1984, where and, and we have to remember that the Naga tribe comprises of a number of different tribes. And so participation or membership of the Naga Mothers Association can be had through the women's organizations of those individual tribes. Now the Naga Mothers Association among its various achievements uh, mediated between the government of Nagaland and the Naga Students Federation over age limit for jobs and arrived at an amicable and equitable settlement. Another achievement of the NMA is the formation of the peace team in 1994 to confront the deteriorating political situation in Nagaland. The Naga Mothers Association has also played an important role in social regeneration, particularly in the areas of controlling and preventing drug abuse and al alcohol abuse, which are widespread malaises of the Naga society. The NMA not only provides facilities for de-addiction, particularly in association with the Kripa Foundation, but also it has started anonymous HIV testing. Uh, another women organization of Nagaland is the Watsumongdang. Now, there was one incident that actually catapulted the Watsumongdang to uh, fame. This took place on the 27th of December 1994 in the town of Mokakchang in Nagaland when 10 members of the Assam Rifles entered the town of Mokakchang and carried on indiscriminate rape, looting and arson. 
The Naga Human Rights Commission entrusted Watsum Mongdang to investigate and identify the victims. And the victims were identified, but many of them, in fact, most of them were hesitant to speak up against the authority. In such a case, members of the Watsum Mongdang decided to litigate on behalf of the rape victims. Although the case is still pending, this was an important achievement in this direction. Another important organization is the Tangkul Chanao Long that operates both in Manipur and Nagaland, particularly in the Tangkul villages in both these states. And what they do is they raise their voice against protest whenever there are human rights violations and whenever there is abuse and, ex and uh, assault of the common people, particularly their youths in uh, the towns of Nagaland and even Manipur. Uh, the Naga Women's Union in Manipur has 15 constituent units and one of the more exceptional ones is the Moyon Sanur Rurkhekh or MSR. This organization included a number of political demands in their annual resolutions, particularly they demanded equal rights for women to inherit property and this, these uh, 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 resolutions were taken to the Moyon Naga Council and uh, in fact the president of the MSR was given the right to vote in that council. These are some of the several organizations in Nagaland and also in Manipur uh, uh, led by women and that are playing or that have been playing over the last few decades a very important role in raising voice of protest against the assaults and atrocities of not only the uh, Indian army or the Indian state but also militants. We have to understand that these organizations do not only oppose the activities or what they presume as atrocities of the Indian states. Now these organizations are often also uh, up in arms against the uh, atrocities or the excesses or the violent excesses of the militant organizations of Nagaland. So we have to uh, understand that these organizations uh, uh, are playing definitely an important role. These three instances from three different parts of the world and three separate time frames highlight how women can play a stellar role in peace negotiations whenever they are called out to. Of course, like it has been mentioned before, these efforts have to be politically supported, supported by the masses and also by the media. Also, we have to understand that these efforts have to be highlighted. Unless they are highlighted and made known to the world at large, these efforts will go unknown. And if they are unknown, then these efforts will not be able to inspire women and people from other parts of the world. Thus, we come to the end of this module. Thank you.